Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Backups and Data Resiliency Made Easy, sponsored by CrashPlan. My name is Mary Lynn Gallier of SANS. Today's featured speakers are Matt Bromley, SANS Certified Instructor, and Eric Hall, Solutions Architect at CrashPlan. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the Q&A window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to our presenters. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world it is you're joining us from. It's great to have you here with us today. I am I'm looking forward to going over this one. Actually, this is a, a really fun SANS first look project that we took on. Um, when I first started to hear about the folks over at CrashPlan, the, uh, the the product, the platform that we'll be talking about today, I was initially kind of like, all right, this is a typical pain point for a lot of organizations here. And uh, I'm not really you know, sure how they go about doing this differently, right? Because everyone you talk to says, oh, we do that thing, but we do it better. We do it differently. We add this, we add that. We make it easier to use or something along those lines. So I went into this. I don't want to say with a little bit of skepticism, but definitely with a little bit of open eyes saying, let's, all right, let's, let's see what's going on here. And what I got was a demo of a, of a really, really awesome hands-on platform that made backups and data resiliency, hence the title here, just easy, seamless in the background, really, really easy to use. So I'm excited to be here today, and I'll be joined by Eric Hall a little bit later on in our webcast as well. But I'm excited to be here today to talk about some of the things that I observed during our first look and some of the things that I just like think this is a really, really cool game changer for organizations that are out there. Now, a quick note for everyone, uh, as part of our SANS First Look project, there is also an associated white paper that goes with this as well. It was just dropped into the Slack channel. Sorry, Slack, the Zoom channel. My gosh, I'm thinking of a solutions forum here. Just dropped into the Zoom chat here. Uh, for those of you who might be watching the recording of this, then you'll be able to find the link for that associated where you saw the registration link for the video as well. But those are available. Both are available. I highly recommend checking them out. The first look paper is going to delve a little bit deeper into some of the things that we'll cover in the webcast here. But as I mentioned, backups and data resiliency made easy is the goal of today's approach and the goal of crash plan, what we observed in our first look. So my name is Matt Bromley. I'm an instructor over here at SANS. I also do a lot of work with the SANS Analyst Program. I'm going to take a shot in the dark and say some of you have probably seen me in one of our solutions forums or one of our webcasts before. Thank you for being back here. For those of you I haven't met, great to have you here. You'll be meeting Eric Hall, a solutions architect over at CrashPlan a little bit shortly. Uh, I'm going to go over a couple of things first, and then we'll get into kind of a back and forth discussion between Eric and myself, but you'll see him sooner than later. I wanted to start out by talking about some of those pain points that I identified in the beginning of today's webcast, really calling out what that looks like for organizations and really some of the things that I've seen during my career and my experience here in information security, followed by a brief look at CrashPlan. We're going to wrap everything up today with a discussion between Eric and myself. We'll both be on camera for that one. Um, however, we won't have slides to support that, but it'll be a really good backup discussion. So again, uh, as Eric and I go through some points later on, you'll really want to tune in and hear the discussion in the back and forth between us because that's going to be the best place to capture some of that content. If there is any external data links or anything we talk about, I'll make sure to grab and drop, drop a, co a copy of those into the chat here for us. But let's start off talking about some of these backups and some of these pain points, the things that I think have plagued organizations for a very, very long time. The first being that data resiliency, data backup, the ability to say, yes, that thing is protected, it's secured, and I have a copy of it somewhere and I can access it when I need to, is absolutely paramount to almost every organization that's out there. And it's not just everyone wants to have this thing and they wish it was better. It's more on the case of it's necessary for business operations. It might be a legal requirement, a regulatory requirement. It might be necessary for compliance, depending on the type of data that you've got. Just general business practices. I might want to retain copies of older things. Um, if you think about the various changes, long-term projects, things that happen, I need to be able to retain data over a period of time. I need to be able to protect that data. We're not even talking about cyber threats yet. 
Of course, there's also the ever-looming cyber threat to data, which may come in the form of data destruction, uh, ransomware, encryption, extortion, any of those other things, where my data then becomes an asset that's held hostage against me as opposed to an asset that I my, my business uses. In any event, this whole concept of resiliency, backups, protections, data security has been an ongoing thing for organizations, but is also an ongoing challenge for many organizations out there as well, because it's very, very tough just to do right. So it's a couple of the pain points that I've seen happen, uh, one of them being just keeping the data intact. Now, as weird as that may sound, there's a lot of times where a really, really good idea ends up fragmenting or moving data around in a way that was not expected or makes it really, really difficult to get back. Hence our, our uh, kind of almost leading into our second point here, which is get, making the data accessible to the right users when they need it. And if I take those first two points and I kind of wrap them into each other and, and talk about those as a cohesive point here, just simply backing up data is relatively straightforward, right? I'm going to make a copy of it somewhere else other than where it is now. And I'm going to, you know, obviously, as the technology gets better, I can expand that statement. But the general idea of a backup is to have it somewhere else. In the purest and most simplest form, if I were to give all my employees USB drives and say, hey, copy over all your stuff every single day, and we're going to store it in a super secure vault that no one can get into and so on and so forth, I've essentially achieved part of the backup process, but I haven't taken care of the other side of that process, which is making it easy for my users to then go back and say, oh, I actually need that thing from yesterday. I need to get a copy of it. It's tough to make it accessible to the right users when they need it. What has happened in the past is you'll have some sort of an administrator or someone in charge of backups whose job it is to go and help retrieve data. And they'll work through the ideas of support tickets or data requests or something along those lines. And as convoluted as that may seem, it's still very apparent and very, very much a workflow in a lot of organizations. Again, we haven't even touched on the cyber threat yet, but what? let's go a step further and say, not only do I need my data accessible during normal business operations, but I also need it to be recoverable during an attack or during a system failure. And I need all of these things without a super complex system to manage. Because that's often been the other pain point that's come out of backup and data resiliency is, oh, I have a tool that can do all of these things but you need a team of 20 to hire and maintain it or to keep it running or to keep it tuned or to deal with all the little nuances that it has. We want all those things a little bit easier. So I came through and I put together a few ideas about how to solve them. Uh, the first being data resiliency must be a background operation, meaning it should be in the background. It should be seamless to users, but it should be effective. I'm really leaning on more modern style of computing and technology here. We're not talking legacy old hard drive backups and things like that. I'm talking about seamless deduplication, seamless backup, recognition of file changes and things like that. I've already got applications that can do this. Let's incorporate that in our backup process. I want data protected. I want it encrypted, both in motion and at rest. And I want users to have granular control. I want my users to be the ones to determine what is needed when is it needed? And where do I deploy? Where do I back it up from? What are my different copies? What does that look like? And this is where Crash Pen came along. So when I got into looking at this product, this platform for the very first time, I set forth some of those ideas. Well, this is difficult. This is tough. You say you can do this thing, but it's very, very hard for some to do. Crash Pen came around and said, we've got a solution that works here. It's a continuous automated backup solution that is constantly, constantly working to help organizations find efficiencies and scale that problem, that idea of data resiliency here. Now, in our first look, I went through and grabbed a couple of different screenshots from them and walked through some key ideas. But I think that there's a few things worth mentioning, both on the user side, on the admin side of how this platform comes together to offer a pretty unique experience. First and foremost, let's talk about the general idea of backups. How does CrashPlan go and assist and address some of this? Number one, it operates in its own cloud. I actually found this to be a really reassuring kind of bullet to throw in there because it means I'm not leaning on some other party or some other platform hoping that they don't ever have an issue. In full encryption, data is encrypted at motion and at rest. 
integration is done seamlessly, both at a user perspective, but also at a domain level or some other sort of parent authentication level as well, while putting the users in control of their data. I know that's something that Eric and I are going to talk about very shortly as well. The user experience is one that essentially says, you need to have access to your backups. I want you to be able to restore what you want when you want it, what you want when you need it. That takes away the idea of needing to lean on some other team or put someone in charge of restoring all of these things and letting the users, the one be empowered to help solve that issue. I go around solving this issue. I should say CrashPlane goes around and solves this issue by, by automatically deduplicating and syncing data every 15 minutes as the users are logged in, as the systems are up, as they're working. What this does is it creates just a constant ongoing process in the background at an enterprise perspective that can hit hundreds or thousands of users simultaneously, and none of them feel the impact. None of them feel the, the, uh, the change of what's happening there. We've got, I grabbed a really uh, simple screenshot here of uh, what it looks like from a user perspective, where a user has the ability to log in, simply select an instance of what it is that they might be looking for and restore that file or files based on the criteria that they're looking for. And in this case right here, we can see a, it's, it's obviously a demo or a setup account, but we can see multiple versions of this file having existed over a course of a two day period here or two and a half, yeah, about a two day period. They're able to see some of the different versions there and able to restore as they need to. This is empowerment of the user, which takes again, that complex idea of restoring backups away from that administrative team. However, from an administrative perspective, CrashPlan also empowers admins a lot as well. So first off, enterprise management. This is one where I look for things like automatic synchronization with, I mentioned a few minutes ago, like Active Directory. Meaning I don't want to pass around an endpoint agent that all my users have to go and install and hopefully I get everyone. I want domain integration. I want seamless deployment. I want cross-platform support. I don't want my Mac users to be left out of the benefits here. CrashPlan is cross-platform support, and they, they've got parity across all platforms as well. As an admin, I want to be able to have as much control as I want. Notice I didn't say granular or detailed control. I want admins to have as much control as they need or can have over that organization. I'm aware data privacy is different in different parts of the world, different states, different companies, different countries, whatever it might be. I want my users or my admins, I should say, to have a different different type of, uh, of approach. CrashPlan solves this by including things such as very, very powerful regex and pattern declarations. I can define keywords. I can define certain important things that I want to have backed up. I can change retention policies. I can also lead and segue right into legal hold capabilities if need be as well. So there's a few different options. And again, I'm not drilling down into every single one. I'm hitting at a high level some of the things that I see solving those pain points from a deployment perspective or from a management perspective as well. So I'm now going to ask Eric to come up and join me on stage, if you will. Eric, how are you doing today? Let me see if I can get you on camera and mic. There he is. How are you doing today? Wonderful. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. I, I, I wanted to start out, Eric, with a really brief introduction into CrashPlan. But before we do that... Uh, you're a solutions architect over there. I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and and uh, I've, I've got a few questions for you. Yeah, so I've been I've been with CrashPlan in in one way, form, or another for the last twelve years as a customer, an account manager, uh, system engineer, and now a solution architect. So awesome. super familiar with the product and and happy to be here. Great, great to have you. Good stuff. Well. Eric, I've got a, a whole bunch of questions. Also, things that have come up during chat from our audience as well. Um, if you're in Zoom, if you want to pull up the Q&A, so you can get a chance to look over those and whatnot. But uh, we'll save those. I, I've got a few other things I want to line up here for you as well. Uh, but I want to talk about your history with CrashPlan. How did you first get started and how did what you have now evolve from where you started at? Yeah, interestingly enough, um, my previous career was in higher education. And I found CrashPlan while going through a conference. And I had it on my home computer using it to back up my data locally to a hard drive. And then when we had to replace our backup solution there at uh, the university I was at, uh, CrashPlan came up in my investigation, beat out the competitors, and, and it's all history from there. They're still running the instance today. Nice, nice. I like that. Okay, good stuff. Yeah. Um, 
uh, I, I'm curious what first drew you to the use of it at your home. Now, let's pause there. Uh, is crash plan still something I can use at my home? Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit. There's there We just launched a new e-commerce platform, so you can actually go sign up on our website and use that at home. Uh, I think it's, I don't know the labeling. It might be professional or... or uh, gotcha. There's a okay. label there. I'm not sure what it is, though. I like it. Well, I, I guess where I was going with that is I wanted to identify that like backups are, are, are and data resiliency in general is an important concept, like whether you're at home, whether you're at business, wherever you're at. So hopefully folks oh, are yeah. seeing that this is something that's critical kind of wherever we go, right? However, I mentioned this and I started talking about it as I went through crash plan. One of the biggest issues I see is that, you know, it, it's not very user centric. Um, admittedly, there's some backup solutions that have started out as very, very user friendly, but then they get like, you know, they get mature and all of a sudden they're like, I, we, we, we can't really have that pretty UI anymore because it takes away from this, takes away from that. However, right. I, I've noticed, and one thing that was kind of said to me quite a lot as we went through our, our demo was that you guys focus very heavily on user focus. And I'm wondering, you know, when it comes to like, what does it look like for a user restoring data? Why is that such an important thing to focus on? Why? And I'll ask this in a very personal way. Why was that pointed out to me so many times? Well, so historically, it's really about the, the backup process also is that a lot of other products, they crush the endpoint when doing a backup and mm -hmm. they take the, the computer away from the end user and put all the resources into collecting that data, encrypting it and sending it to storage. And we do that in a really seamless way where the end user doesn't even know it's running. We have enterprises where they barely know that it's running in the background, but then that restore process given to the end user, they can go in and view their files very easily. It's the same tree they'd be looking at in Windows, Linux, or, or Mac. And they're able to find the files quickly, select them and start that restore process. And whether it's a small file or a whole collection of files, it actually comes down incredibly fast and it prioritizes the first, the last thing you backed up, the last thing you were working on is the first thing to come back. So it puts the user experience at the forefront of our product. I like that. I, I think uh, that's an important takeaway for some folks that are out there as well, especially those of you who might be kind of thinking about, you know, hey, we've got to employ or, or deploy something new, something different here because this process just isn't working. And, and again, as I called out in the very beginning of starting this webcast here, it's such an important business continuity concept. And, and again, compliance regulations, whatever it might be, very, very critical to have. So if I'm at that point of like, how can I maybe make this easier? User experience is one I'm, I'm focusing on here. Let me talk about architecture in the background. And I'm calling you out here as a solutions architect as well. Crash plan, personal cloud, or not personal, but you guys built and, and went with your own cloud, correct? Yeah, absolutely. What what was that decision? Because if I'm going to go create something these days, I'm going to go to you know a major cloud provider and say, hey, I just need a bunch of storage space, pretty please. Yeah. So I think the, the decision was made really early on in the company to make to do that. Because if we're putting the user at the at the center of what we're doing and security also, it's like one in, one A, one B for, for us. If you're putting the user at it, you don't want to make decisions about storage and moving things to, you know, different storage locations to save costs and everything like that. So by owning the storage and being complete control, all the user's data is stored in premium storage, accessible all the time. We're able to control. We don't have throttles. If you can pull the data down as quickly as you want, you get it because we're in complete control of that environment. And we do have six storage locations around the world. I like it. So it's a little bit of control and flexibility over, uh, you know, I mean, first off, not just, um, not, not, not just kind of like, you know, making sure the data is available, but also being able to find efficiencies and deploy them at any scale you want. Well, yeah. And, and I think the, the, going back 20 years ago when this product was first launched, the mm -hmm. idea was always to give unlimited data storage. Right. And it's been limited from day one and it's still unlimited. And a lot of people, when they get on the phone with me, they're like, no, no, really, where's the catch? Like, do I have to pay for ingress? Do I have to pay for egress? It's no, it's yeah. completely unlimited. You can store as much with us as you want. You can go get it when you want it. And there's no meter that we're watching to say, hey, you've you've over consumed or you've overindulged in our product. If you're getting value out of it, we've done our job and we're glad that you're happy. Tell your friends. Nice. I like that. I like that. I, I I admittedly did not actually know that until just this moment. So it's uh unlimited storage, you're saying. Yeah, I, I'm actually working with somebody to recover multiple terabytes from from our archives 
uh, this week. I just got off a call it yesterday that helping them sort of aim it to where they want to store it because they have no location they can store locally to review the data for for one of their projects they're working on. Oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. What a, what a, what a great like what a great approach to as, as they go through this. Um, so I, I want to take a little bit. We've had some questions come in from from the audience, which I think might actually be worth taking a look at, Eric, just because they've come through. Now, feel free to be like, hey, uh, that's something, you know, go check out our site for or something like that. But I, I think it's an interesting one that's out here. Um, so there was one person who just uh, came through and said, not seeing the first look paper on the link posted in the chat. Uh, if I'm going to double check myself. However, whoever is looking for that, you might need to, uh, you might need to log in, but we just reposted the link again. It should be there. I just went in and just double checked that it's there. You might need to log in first though, which is one thing. Um, there's Schrodinger's backup, which has come in. Someone has stated the condition of any backup is unknown until a restore is attempted. And I think that's actually a very clever way to to yeah. think about the quality of a backup. Sure. All right. I... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say it's it's an interesting it's an interesting way to frame it, and it's it's sort of a trust for our customers, right? The first time because they're buying it from us and they're giving it to their end users, and their end users have that skepticism, like, "Am I really safe?" Um, and so some of those customers that have been with us for you know our our average customers been with us for twelve years, that when they first get it, there's that trust fall. They have to go through a few instances to gain that trust and visibility into what we do. But once we hit that that ground running, we we are successful in those attempts. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes second nature, and they rely on us to the point where they do some of their most critical data uh, moves, like data migrations, without even thinking about it. It's crash plan's got it, no problem. Let's move on. That's awesome. I love that. That's got to be a great feeling too when someone's leaning on you that much. So, very Absolutely. nice. Very very Absolutely. nice. All right. Uh, another one came through. Um, this one might be, it, was, it definitely was during when I was talking a lot. So it might've been geared towards some of the things that I was saying. So I'll tackle this one first here. I can just see uh, when you talk about data protection and resiliency to be background, seamless, less touch, less admins, is that only for desktops and workstations? Or do you mean for enterprise servers too large or sorry, two for large computing organizations? So the person who asked this, um, I think of this I, when I think of backups and data resiliency and whatnot, especially some of the concepts I was talking about at the beginning here, I look at this as a necessary function for an enterprise. Um, whatever that function may include is going to obviously change from enterprise to enterprise. And I don't want to be vague in my answer, but I'm going to say it depends. However, my product should not be the one, the platform that we use should not be the one that dictates whether this is easy or not. As an enterprise, I should be able to say, I need, you know, let's just, let's use a progress bar, right? I need 40% of my computing effort to fall under this regulatory requirement or whatever it is. Or someone else might say, I need 95%. I want a platform or product that says, no problem, let me adjust. So when I say seamless and in the background, there shouldn't be, and I'm kind of leaning towards some of the things I hope Eric's going to bring up here, but I'm kind of leaning towards I just discovered I need to do something new. Oh, now I have to pay for a different data cap or now I have to send to somewhere else or my bandwidth gets restricted or now I need to enroll different systems. So I'm deploying a much more intensive endpoint solution or something like that. I don't want any of those to make me consider, well, should I be doing backups here or not? When I say seamless, I mean, it should be as functional as just someone logging into the background. Eric, any thoughts on kind of, you know, those those key points there and and, and may, maybe how CrashPlan meets folks in the middle there? Yeah, so we are really focused on the endpoints. And the reason being is that end users are going to do what they're going to do. You tell them to put things in one location so it can be picked up by a random program. Uh, they are or are not going to do that. And so you have to, you know, put a lot of trust in the end users. CrashPlan's platform allows you to, to aim at the entire drive, add multiple drives and manage it from anywhere and the updates are instantaneous on the endpoint. If they're connected, they're gonna get those updates. But we don't focus on the servers. We, we really focus on the endpoint, on the end user experience and making it really uncomplicated for every environment is a tough task. We have hundreds of options that you can go through and check and change. And the way that we design our product is that every group can be in their own subcategory and have their own set of rules and they can all be adjusted on the fly. You could uh, enroll anybody in legal hold, for example, within the product. So when it comes to making it easy and simple, that first initial wave of configuration does take a little bit of extra time. It might take you, you know, when I configured it at my, at my previous higher education institution, there's a lot of questions and a lot of answers that had to be done. 
that took the most amount of time. Actually configuring the product took very little time at all. And we would mm -hmm. do a review once, once or twice a year just to make sure we had it fine tuned. Nice. Very nice. I like that. Um, Derek, this might be a question for you. One came in and said, uh, how many administrators do you typically see running a large environment? Any chance you've got that stat offhand or, or can give us a, so, you know, an anecdote? Or yeah, so I, I work with some of the largest uh, companies in the country, Fortune mm -hmm. 50s and, and around that area. So, so our largest cu uh, customer has 300,000 users. Yeah. And so they use two administrators to manage the entire environment. Most of my most of my customers are in that fifty thousand to thirty five thousand range, and they might have uh, two administrators as well. But typically, it's just because somebody needs to take vacation at some point, so you always need right, a backup. Right. It, coincidentally, you always need a backup of your data and of your admins. So, huh. um, but we we do trainings with them. We make sure that they're up to up to date. Our mm -hmm. CX team is really good about engaging with them, making sure as we make changes and improvements to the products that everybody is trained and up to speed. Great question. Gotcha. I like that. And uh, just a quick note for anyone who maybe didn't catch that or was as stunned as I was the first time that uh, Eric threw that out there, um, 300,000 employees, two, two administrators, uh, companies smaller usually have, I'm going to call it one and a half administrators because someone's doing it part-time. Um, yeah. They're not one and a half people. It's one and a half job. There you go. So nonetheless, uh, very manageable. Yeah. And I think it's also important to, to point out, Matt, is that you know, we have we have a product that can scale all the way up to 300,000 as we've proven, but that's the exact same product you get if you have an office of 50 people. There's no mm -hmm. difference in the code base, the deployment, anything like that. It's really the maturity of the environment we're plugging into, and but we can do it at scale and it scales up with your business or scales down with your business depending on who you are and what your goals are. Nice. I think that's an important takeaway for everyone here too, is you're not getting some sort of substandard, you know, oh, because your company's small, right? And things like that. Um, awesome. Uh, one quick question, and, and, and Eric, this is probably going to be a link, um, but uh, someone was asking if you have a list of certifications held by your data centers available on the web. I'm assuming that's probably somewhere on there, right? It's not on the website. We do take data security and our security extremely um, personally, right? We, we're really yeah. into it. So when you sign up with Crash Plan, uh, just to even talk about contracts or get a review of the product, we do have you sign an NDA and then we'll hand those things over to you so you can review them. But we've passed security reviews for some of the biggest uh, companies in the world. And mm -hmm. we're working on uh, some of those bigger projects where we have to have um, different certifications in place, but we've passed all those tests in my experience. Absolutely. And I'm also going to drop a link in. This should go to everyone as well. Um, there is a security, privacy, and compliance page as well that I definitely recommend checking out. So awesome. Um, Eric, while I've got you, one other, not not one other, we'll see. We might have time for one more, but uh, something else that kind of came to mind as we were going through this as well. Um, what kind of challenges do you see folks having in the future when it comes to these, these types of concepts and whatnot? Like, what are the things to be planning for? If I'm an org looking at 2024, 2025, where should I, where should my head be at? Well, I think in the last couple of years, the the entire um, business landscape has changed and we've got a lot of people working from home, working remotely, and the new workforce is demanding that they're accessible to do that, right? They want to work from a beach somewhere or they want to work from their apartment in New York and, and have their office somewhere else. And that's really pushed a lot of end users off of the domain and it's pushed them into kind of the wild, right? Where they're in control of their network, the endpoint is off network, and you don't have as much control as you wanted back in the day. And so that's made a lot more risks available to those end users. And it's made it harder for IT departments to manage those endpoints. We have customers today that are using our product to manage their device replacement, even though they have an entirely remote workforce, they send the user a new computer, it arrives in their home, they open it, they sign in to their pre-configured device, they launch crash plan, hit restore, all their data flows down to their endpoint. They pack up the other one and send it back. That process used to take you multiple hours uh, in, an, in an environment. And for one of our customers, they got it down to under 30 minutes with the exchange with the end users. And they're saving over a million dollars in lease uh, overage overages on their leased equipment. So as I, as I, I like that you call that out because I remember the days, Eric, where it used to be a patch cable between the oh. two systems, <laughs> setting those up. Awesome. Well, uh, we, we are j just about out of time, but last cool question for you. Um, yeah. Eric, first off, thank you for being here with me. If folks wanted to learn more about CrashPlan, what are some other things that they could do to, to find out more? 
Yeah, go to go to crashplan.com. You can you can definitely l- review our website. Our knowledge base is completely online. You can sign up for a, a free trial and get a get a couple of weeks for free of our product. Like I said, it's the same product you're going to download there that you're going to get in the in the enterprise. And if you do test it out, you do like it, you engage with sales and you become a customer, that that environment can actually be migrated right into production, no problem. So you're not going to waste any effort there. Awesome. Love it. All right. Well, with that said, Eric, thank you so much for joining me here today, folks. That is all we got time for. I'm going to hand it back to Mary Linda, take us home. But as usual, thank you. A huge, huge, huge thanks to Crashplan for bringing this together. And, uh, you know, Eric, I appreciate you coming on and we got to spend about uh, 17 minutes going through and some great stories there. Folks, if this is something you're looking for, uh, crashplan.com. See you there. Thanks, Matt. Thank you so much, Matt and Eric, for your great presentation. And to Crashplan for sponsoring this webcast, which helps to bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.